Yeah. So thanks a lot for the invitation. It's really a, a pleasure as well as an honor to be here with you today. Uh, as was announced, so the maybe I closed the door. When it's quiet again, we can reopen it. Right. <laughs> Good. Uh, so as was announced, I'm going to uh, discuss some open mathematical problems for quantum charged particles. And so the, the main uh, first point I have to tell you is that I'm a mathematician. So that's the, the mu here. So it may well be that what is an open problem for me is not an open problem for you. So uh, as a mathematician, what is an open problem? So it means that uh, it's a problem for which there is no rigorous proof, okay? No rigorous proof. Which, uh, of course, uh, restricts a lot the, the perspective, in a way. So there are many uh, questions for which are considered as being very well understood uh, uh, on, the, on the physical side, which are not at all understood on the mathematical side. So then we, maybe you would not call it an open problem, and I would. So in uh, several cases, you, one can consider it's well understood when, for instance, there is some physical intuition be, behind the result or maybe some very heavy numerics uh, that confirm some results, or maybe sometimes that uh, one can understand the situation on a simpler model, and we decide that it must be okay on the more complicated model. And even though when sometimes you have these three points, it can happen that it's extremely hard to give a full, fully rigorous mathematical proof. Okay, so that's gonna be the definition of uh, open problem uh, in this talk. And so maybe the first question you want to ask me uh, is uh, why should we care? So why? Why should we care about, um, so let me see, I'm going to put it a little bit more, just to be able to, write. so what should, why should we care about providing uh, rigorous proofs? Okay, that's maybe the first question. So why should we care about these open problems? Uh, so. Of course, the first reason is that when you have a rigorous proof, it's a different kind of truth. So you have a certain model, you have a real rigorous proof, you know for sure that it has the property that you want. So it's a different uh, kind of truth. Uh, however, I have to tell you that uh, I don't consider particularly interesting just taking a physical argument and then putting function spaces on epsilon. I mean, it's probably okay, and maybe one has to do it, but it's not the most interesting, in a way. So it's much more interesting when, in a way, the physical arguments do not lead to an easy proof. And then one has to find something completely different. So it's much more interesting when, when looking for a proof, one is uh, led to, uh, to find a completely different way of explaining a physical phenomenon. And so it's much more interesting when there is some new physical insight uh, coming from this proof, from this mathematical proof. And of course, it's much more demanding if you want to approach a question like this, but I think that's what we have to do as mathematical physicists or mathematicians. So uh, this was the why. So maybe now uh, the what. So. What are the kind of things that we can prove mathematically? And so I have to tell you that mathematically, it's extremely hard and probably not doable to prove extremely precise results on specific models. Okay, so if you give me this molecule, for instance, and that molecule, I will never be able to explain to you why they behave differently, right? Because mathematics is not appropriate for this. So the kind of properties that we look at mathematically are usually uh, universal properties, generic properties. Okay, so universal properties, generic. So the idea is to explain some physical phenomenon with a very broad perspective, okay? And so these are the kind of uh, open problems that I will uh, describe to you today. 
for charged particles. So I'm going to look at uh, quantum charged particles. So meaning interacting with the Coulomb uh, potential, which uh, in atomic units is just the product of the charges divided by the distance between two particles. So this Coulomb potential, as you know very well, has two uh, properties. So first, it's singular at the origin, meaning that when particles are very close, I mean, they interact quite a bit. So there is the singularity at uh, the origin. And this singularity at the origin uh, forces us to work with quantum mechanics if we want uh, our system to be stable. So it's the kinetic energy which, uh, um, I mean, which permits the systems to exist in a way and not to collapse. But the Coulomb problem also has the specificity that it's a very long range. So it decays very slowly at infinity. And so each particle will typically, typically see what many of the other particles in the system are doing, uh, which is a very big problem in a way, as soon as you consider very large systems. And actually, to explain why very large Coulomb systems exist, the only way is to prove that there is some screening. And so the main word here is really screening. One has to explain how screening happens. And this is the main problem that uh, uh, we mathematicians are in a way fighting with. Explain why particles arrange themselves in a way that they would, they would screen uh, charges locally such that the, the electrostatic potential is not too crazy when you look far away. So I will uh, discuss two kinds of uh, charged particles. I will concentrate mainly my talk on just electrons, right, which I guess is probably the most natural. And I will also quickly mention some charged bosons, but uh, not much, okay? So I will start my talk by discussing uh, electrons, in particular in atoms and molecules, in solids. And uh, my first open problems will be for the molecular Hamiltonian. So I'm going to consider the following Hamiltonian, H V of N. So N is the number of electrons. And V is the external potential. And so you know that uh, in atomic units, the Hamiltonian is the following. So I am going to sum over the, the electrons. I have the kinetic energy, which I write in this form. So it's the minus Laplacian uh, in all directions. So xj, maybe right here. So x1, xn are the positions of the n electrons. Then I have my external potential which I will specify in a minute, okay? So I just submit my n electrons to an external uh, potential. It's gonna be an electrostatic potential. And then I have the interaction between the electrons, which is the, just the sum of a pairs, one over xj minus xk, the distance, okay? So that's my Hamiltonian. And the uh, typical V, so that's the main uh, beast uh, for this uh, talk. And a typical V is a, is a V that's induced uh, by some nuclei. So if I look at some uh, atoms or molecule, then I just fix some nuclei. And then V would be minus the sum, uh, M equals one to M of uh, Zm divided by X minus Rm. And so in this case, then R1, Rm, also in R3 are the positions of uh, the nuclei and Z1, Zm, uh, which are integers, are the charges of the nuclei, okay? Uh, I do not 
add uh, the nuclear uh, repulsion, which is just a constant. I can add it if you like. But here I'm just concentrating on the electrons and I'm working in atomic units. Okay? Of course, the electrons have spin, but here you don't see it in the Hamiltonian if you only uh, look at this uh, charge problem. So for instance, if you look at water, then you have uh, H2O like this. So in this case, that would be uh, R1. If you like, you can take it to be zero. That would be R2, R3, and then uh, Z1 would be eight, uh, Z2 would be equal to Z3, that would be one, and N is 10. Very good, and of course, we are interested in solving uh, Schrodinger's equation. I'm going to discuss the stationary problem. So I want to look at the spectrum of H. Maybe I want to look at the eigenvalues, eigenfunctions of H, okay? So they correspond to uh, stationary states for my N electrons. And maybe I want to look at the ground state. I mean, there are these three levels, spectrum, eigenvalues, and then even ground state. So E of, oops, I guess I have to do V and N is going to denote the ground state uh, energy. Oh. So the lowest eigenvalue of my Hamiltonian. And uh, remember, of course, that Psi is actually a function of uh, position and spin. And it must, of course, be anti-symmetric because electrons are fermions. So that's the equation I want to look at. So uh, maybe I have to do a little bit of uh, history for you to tell you what uh, mathematical physicists have done and the kind of problems they, they looked at. And so I think one can say that uh, everything started in the 50s with uh, Kato. So this field really started with a Japanese uh, researcher, Kato. What Kato did was essentially to show that this uh, H of uh, Vn is well defined as, a, as an operator. Uh, he did more in a way. So he explained to us that there is an, a unique way of defining this operator. So there's no question on the definition in a way. There's a unique way, a unique domain, if you like, for this operator. And what's a little bit unfortunate is that this unique domain is actually not so easy. So it involves Sobolev spaces, distributions, Lebesgue spaces. I mean, lots of uh, actually very involved mathematical objects. I'm not going to discuss them here. But that's the, the unique way of defining this operator. If you restrict yourself to only very nice psi, then the spectrum is the whole complex plane. Okay, so the only way is to wear, use these uh, complicated spaces, but I'm not going to go into these details now. So, uh, then in the 60s, people started to study the spectral properties of this uh, operator, and then there the big names are Gislin on the Russian side, and uh, Hunziker in Switzerland, and many other people. And uh, there's also Dyson, who uh, in the end of the 60s really started the study of large systems. So he started the question of uh, stability of matter, so that's when you put lots of nuclei, lots of electrons. And he also studied the charge the gas. And the works of Dyson, they, they have had really a huge influence of what happened in the next decades. So in the 70s, people really started to concentrate, or say on the American side, they started to concentrate a lot on uh, large systems due to Dyson. And um, also the, the, the gelium, so the uniform electron gas in particular. So that's in the case where 
uh, V is not just some nuclei, but it's a uniform uh, spectrum. And uh, there the big names are Lieb, Thierry, and many others, probably Lebovitz, and many others. Uh, in the 80s, uh, people started to, to look at uh, nonlinear problems, so nonlinear approximations to uh, this uh, many body problem, as well as to look at the ionization problem, so ionization, which I'm going to discuss today, the ionization problem, as well as uh, Hartree Fock and uh, density functional theory. So they started to look at nonlinear approximations. Uh, to, the, to the problem over there. And so in addition to Lieb, uh, there are Simon, Seagal, Ben-Gurion, and many other people. Uh, in the 90s, the interest uh, shifted a little bit, and people really uh, studied a lot large atoms. Okay, so that's the limit when uh, n is very large and z is very large. So say m is equal to 1. So you just look at one atom of a very large uh, nuclear charge. And so the names are, of course, again, Lieb, and then Bar Solovay, who is going to give a talk tomorrow, but only about bosons, I think. He's the expert on this, so you can ask questions to him as well. When He's arrived. And uh, Pfefferman, who is uh, one of our fields medalists, who uh, was very much interested in quantum mechanics in the 90s. Around 90, so uh, namely uh, between 88 and 92, I think, uh, people could uh, prove or study scattering for the first time. So this is when uh, scattering was developed for this Hamiltonian over there. It's very complicated because it's long range. And so the names here are Seagal, Sofer, and Derijinsky, and many others. Then around 2000, 2010, uh, people started to look at um, the coupling to photons. So namely, you take your molecular Hamiltonian and then you turn on the photon field and you see what's happening. And so the question is whether the ground state remains. It was proved that the ground state remains. And what is happening to the other eigenvalues? They become resonances. You can compute the lifetime and so on and so forth. So there the, they were, they are very famous works by Bar Frölich. Seagal, and also Liebloss, and others. And uh, there it's also the period where there was a lot of uh, nonlinear study of nonlinear problems, as well as uh, numerics. OK, so try trying to get some uh, I mean, some convergence rates for some numerical approximations, for instance, to Hartree Fock, and so on and so forth. So, some names are Frieseke, Le Bris, here in France, Eric Consens, maybe a little bit myself. And I have to mention that in the same period, uh, the charge Bose gas. was actually solved by Lieb and Solovay. You see, it took a long time to be able to put Dyson's uh, argument on some rigorous footing. And then what's happening now, to finish my, my history, uh, so, so, so there were a lot of, work, a lot of works about uh, density functional theory recently, so I working on this right now, and also on the, the uniform electron gas, or gelium, I don't know how you call it. 
So we worked a lot on this problem with Lieb and Robert Seiringer. And uh, there are also many very interesting works about what chemists call strictly correlated electrons, okay, which is essentially DFT for classical Coulomb systems, strictly correlated electrons, okay, so that's DFT for classical electrons. And uh, there it's uh, very nice because there is a nice uh, link with uh, the theory of optimal transport. And so the, the names here are on the chemist side, Gori, Georgi, and Seidel. Germany, and then on the mathematical side, there is uh, Di Marino, so it, it's essentially some Italian teams, De Pascale, and many other. Okay, so that was a very quick overview of uh, the kind of themes which have been developed uh, in the past, uh, why, well, 60 years or so. So now I'm going to discuss our first open problem uh, which is a very famous problem. I have to tell you, it's a very hard problem. We have, we've been, wor I mean, not me, but people have been working on this for many, many years. It's open. I think it's still very interesting. And it's what's called the ionization conjecture. If you type ionization conjecture on Google, you will get all the references that you need. So uh, what is the ionization conjecture? So let me remind you or tell you what's the form of the spectrum of this operator over there. Maybe I do a drawing. So the form of the spectrum is the following. So here you've got zero, and here you've got uh, continuous spectrum. Uh, there it is. And the continuous spectrum starts when one electron has been removed from the system so here is actually the ground state energy of n minus one electrons. This is where, when the continuous spectrum starts. And then um, when your system is either neutral or positively charged, then there are infinitely many eigenvalues converging to the bottom of the spectrum. Here is E of uh, Vn, that's the ground state energy. And this picture here is when n is less or equal than the sum, so the nuclear charge, the total nuclear charge, which I'm going to call Z, capital Z. Okay, so you look at the total nuclear charge, and then when you have less electrons than nuclei, uh, then you have infinitely many bound states. What's nice is that this here is the exact threshold in the sense that when so here is E of V n minus one, it's the same drawing. So when n is larger or equal than z plus one, let me remind you z is an integer, of course. Okay, so when you are in the opposite situation, then it's known that there are finitely many bound states. Okay, maybe there's no bound state, but for sure there are finitely many. So finitely, many, and here, infinitely many, okay? Uh, this was actually quite hard to prove. So although the first uh, result is quite old, so it's due to Gislin and collaborators in the 60s, uh, the second result is actually very hard because you have to, I mean, it, it, it depends a lot on the fact that it's Coulomb. Uh, it, it was proved in the 70s and 80s by uh, also Gislin, there was a first argument in 71. And then there is Yafaev who passed away recently. He was a professor in Rennes. And uh, Seagal in 82. So they, they, they proved this result that there are finitely many bound states. And when n increases, so when n becomes very large, then at some point there's no bound state at all. Okay, so no bound state, meaning that the E 
n is actually equal to the e v of n minus one. So somehow, if you are trying to put n electrons, they don't want to stay. There's, I mean, some electrons have to escape to infinity. And so this happens after you reach uh, some critical n, which depends on your molecule. Okay. So. Maybe I put a street, okay? So what is NC of V? NC of V is the maximum, the, the highest number of electrons that your molecule can accommodate. This was also quite hard to prove and is due to a seagull. I'm sorry, let me, where am I? This. Sorry. There is a third blackboard which was hidden. Is it okay? Yes, maybe I can do a little bit more. Okay. Good. Uh, and so, what is the ionization conjecture? So that's problem one. Uh, prove the ionization conjecture. That's problem one. Uh, show that this critical number of electrons that a molecule can bind uh, is bounded by a z plus constant times the number of uh, atoms, uh, where c is maybe one or two. So in reality, so when you look at an atom, it can never bind more than one extra electron. That's, a, that's an observation from life, okay? And so uh, people thought that if you take any molecule, the, num the total number of electrons that you can put, so first you make it neutral, and then maybe you can put one more or maybe two, uh, say one more per atom, and that's it, okay? So that's one very famous conjecture. I'm going to tell you later why I think it's interesting. I mean, what's interesting is not so much the conjecture itself, but the kind of tool that would have to be developed to prove it. But I will explain later. Uh, I think this conjecture is due to Lieb, but it's never been written uh, in the 80s. And uh, now it's a well-known conjecture, and I think it appeared for the first time in a paper by uh, Simon in 2000 in uh, the Journal of Mathematical Physics, but it's definitely older. And if you type ionization conjecture, you will in particular find a, a long paper by Nam, uh, who wrote a chapter in a book that we edited for the 90th birthday of uh, Elliot Lieb, uh, where there's a whole chapter about this conjecture. So what's known, okay? So what's known about the conjecture? Then I'm going to explain to you why I think it's interesting. So what's known about the conjecture? So first, Lieb, in 84, he proved that NC is less than 2Z plus M. So you see it has the kind of same structure, but there's a factor two here, which is definitely uh, unphysical. And the best bound known so far is due to NAM in uh, 2012, and that's only for atoms, so it's for m equals one. He proved that nc is less than 1.22z plus three z to the one third. That's the best known, at the mo uh, known bound at the moment. Uh, then there is a paper by Lieb, Seagal, Simon, and Turing in 88, where they proved that it is true that asymptotically, uh, the system wants to be neutral in the sense that nc divided by z tends to one when z goes to infinity for m equals one. Okay, so if you look at a very large atom, then the asymptotic number, largest number of electrons you can put is of order z, as you would explain. However, I mean, uh, getting z plus constant, I mean, is much more than saying uh, z plus little o of z. 
So there are these works by Pfefferman and Seco. Uh, from 90, where they prove that NC is also for an atom is Z plus a big O of Z to the five over seven. And that's the best bound. You see we are extremely far away from proving the conjecture. Uh, the conjecture was actually proved by uh, Solovay in 03. So proof, but for Hartree-Fock. But for the true many-body problem, uh, we have no clue. So why should we care? Why do we care? Um, I don't think that the conjecture itself, I mean, you will tell me, but I don't think that the conjecture itself is so interesting physically, okay? But what's interesting is the physical effect behind that would imply the conjecture, okay? And for this, we have no clue how to uh, exhibit or how to explain or how to quantify these physical effects. And so the only reason why this conjecture is true is because there is a very complicated interplay between uh, the quantum nature and, in fact, the fermionic nature of electrons and Coulomb. Okay, so it's, it's believed that it's a, a complicated competition, if you like, uh, between the Fermi pressure, if you like, between the Pauli principle, between the Pauli principle and Coulomb. And in fact, it's only because electrons are fermions that this conjecture can be right. And it was proved that uh, for bosons, so if you make the funny assumptions that electrons are bosons, which they are not, uh, then the conjecture is wrong. So the NC actually for M equals one behaves like 1.21 times C. So in an atom where the charged particles are bosons, then they can actually accommodate much more electron or uh, negative particles uh, than expected. And the reason is that bosons, they love each other so much that they have no problem uh, having a much higher charge than the nuclei and the nucleus. And so you see that it's really a competition between Coulomb and the fermionic nature of electrons that must imply this conjecture, and it's definitely very interesting uh, to try to uh, make this uh, rigorous and understand uh, how to do it. And there are many other uh, conjectures around the same problem, which should all have the same explanation. So the picture is the following. So let me look again at a very large atom. Okay, and I'm just plotting the density of electrons. So here I have this huge nucleus of uh, charge Z, say very large. Yes, yes, yes. So, so if you get the imagine that the electron is a boson. Yes. Then I wish to do it the other way around and say the, the nuclei for you are frozen. So mm -hmm. yes. yes. But then if I say put them both on Okay, then it works. Right. So, so, so that's yes, that's yes, that's yes, that works, of course. So one of the two have, have, have to be bosons. Yes. Exactly. Exactly, so my nuclei are just classical and frozen, and then electrons have to be fermions. Exactly. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, so what's the picture of a large atom? There are many pictures of that kind in the literature, if you look at, uh, I mean. Anyway, so, so the picture is the following that the, so what's surprising, maybe not for you, but uh, for me is that very large atom have a finite radius. So the radius does not increase with Z, okay? Which is a bit strange. So the electrons, they are actually more packed and more packed when Z increases so that the radius is actually essentially constant. So the electrons, they live essentially in a ball of uh, size proportional to n to the minus a third, okay? And then if you look 
at distance O of 1 from the nucleus, then you should see a density of order 1. And here is where chemistry happens. And this is where these additional electrons that one can put should live. And so what remains to be understood and that we do not understand at all is how this huge number of electrons screen very well the nucleus so as to make sure that only finitely many electrons, the valence electrons, can live and experiment a finite electrostatic potential. Okay, so we have to understand how here everything is screened so that here everything is finite, even though you have a huge, huge charge in total. And this is only due to the fermionic nature of electrons, and we do not know how to do this at all. The expert on this is uh, Jan Philipp Solovay, and so please ask him all the questions. I want to discuss another open problem. Okay, we, we can discuss this later, of course. I was told that uh, we need the uh, subjects for the discussion, uh, which is the convexity in N uh, conjecture. Uh, it's really an open problem uh, coming from chemistry, I think, but also from physics. And so uh, let me state uh, the following. So that's problem two. Understand for which V, okay, so I should say maybe for which molecule, but so far all, uh, well, I mean, let me comment later. So for which external potential, um, the map uh, where you, you take the number of electrons and you compute the ground state energy is convex. Okay, so it's a discrete function, but I mean, you know what it means to be convex. So convex means that the E uh, V of N minus E V of N minus one is less than E V of N plus one minus E V of N, which are all negative, by the way. So that's problem number two, and that's for all N. So experimentally, it's a fact that uh, it costs more and more energy to remove electrons. Okay, so if, if you take an atom or, and you start removing electrons, you compute the energy you have to pay, okay, uh, then it grows which is what's written here, okay? Or the other way, the other way around, somehow it costs less and less energy to add electrons. By the way, after a while, it doesn't cost any because if you put your electron, it's, it just uh, uh, go away, right? So uh, at some point, this becomes zero, right? Because of what I told you before. And so people have observed that it was always convex in all uh, numerical simulations that have been uh, made. Uh, why do we care? About uh, this convexity. Uh, so this convexity tells you that the grand canonical problem coincides with the canonical problem for finite systems. Okay, so it's kind of nice. But it was really put forward by people in density functional theory um, because this is what allows you to consider fractional uh, occupation numbers, in a way. Fractional, even fractional charges, but say fractional occupations. And so there is a very famous paper by uh, Purdue, uh, Parr, Levy, and Baldus in 82. Uh, where they make actually uh, essentially this conjecture that this must be convex. And this is very well explained in the book by Parr and Young, uh, which is from 89. If you go to page 72, uh, you will see that they make the, the explicitly the conjecture that for all molecules and all atoms, uh, this property must be right. Um, this was also studied by Lieb, but maybe I mention this later. It's not so nice to write here because I will have to cover the blackboard. It's really stupid. 
Uh, now I made the mistake. Um, there's also a link with uh, gr the theory of Green's function. Okay, so uh, if you want to read more about this, I'm not going to spend too long. You can just look at Lesoripka. Uh, they actually mention the conjecture uh, on page uh, 486. And by the way, they give a counterexample in nuclear physics. I mean, numerical example. Now, I, I'll have to cover this blackboard. I'm very sorry. So maybe I wait one minute. Or maybe I just erase. Maybe that's the easiest, but no. Yes, just wait. So now, which one is which? I don't know. Let me try this one. OK. Yes, you can ask the question. No, no, I have a question. I no. just suggest that we get You prefer the other one. OK, very good. Uh, which one was this? I don't know. This one, yes. Good. Uh, what do we know? Uh, actually, there are only negative results so far, which say that it must be very complicated, right? Because there are only negative results. Um, so what do we know? So Lieb in 83. He explained that if it's true, then it must be specific to Coulomb because it's wrong for hard core. Wrong for hard core. So if you replace the Coulomb interaction by hard core, uh, then it's actually wrong. He gave a very simple example with uh, two particles. I mean, n equals two, so you compare E2 with E1, E3, and uh, you take four sites Okay, kind of a triangle with a point in the middle. You can read the, the counter example. Then uh, it was proved by uh, Levy Leblanc in uh, 68, and actually Phillips and Davidson in 83, that it's wrong for the harmonic interaction. So if you assume that they interact with uh, x squared, then you can actually, and actually you put also an external uh, harmonic potential, then you can actually compute everything and you see it's wrong. So if, if it's true, well, I mean, numerics says it's always true for when it's been tested. So if it's true, it's really specific of Coulomb. And then uh, there's a very recent paper by Ayers who uh, revisited the proof of Lieb. And he said, well, instead of hardcore, let's put a RIS potential, one over x minus y to the power s. Right? Because when s is infinite, it's hardcore. When s is one, it's Coulomb. So we see how far we can push down S, and he realized that it's wrong for S bigger than 1.27. So we are getting close to, but when I say wrong, I say that you can find the potential, okay? But so unfortunately, uh, the V for which it's wrong is not an atomic uh, V or molecular V, okay? So the V is not so physical. Okay, when I say it's wrong, I have to come up with an external potential for which the EN is not convex. And uh, the V that Ayers found 
for S very close to 1.27 is not of uh, the form that's written here. Well, actually, it's of that form, but for Z extremely small. So not an integer. So it's not so physical. And then when I was preparing this talk, I realized that I also proved the conjecture without knowing. So it's always good to prepare talks about problems. Uh, so um, anyway, so I wrote a paper with uh, Di Marino and Luca Nena, and that was about uh, strictly correlated electrons. And uh, actually, uh, so without knowing, we constructed a counterexample for Coulomb. For Coulomb, but again uh, with a crazy V. Okay, and so if this conjecture is true, maybe it's true for atoms. So all numerics seem to say that it's really convex for atoms. Um, maybe it's true for molecules, but... In a way, yes. Yes, it's a very good remark, but the, the effective Z is tiny. It's not an integer. So I would know how to do if uh, Z was an integer, but uh, anyway. So I think it's not understood at all, this conjecture. It seems to be important for, I mean, important. But uh, that's the best that's known so far. Uh, I think it's not been studied very much on the mathematical side. Maybe we should uh, invest more in this direction. And that's the best, best that's known. Okay. Very good. Um, we said that we postpone questions, but if you have any urgent question, please go ahead. I think it's also good to have some interaction. Because I'm going now to discuss something else. Yes, Alfred. I mean, in 2D, uh, there are results about uh, 2D uh, anions, but uh, I don't remember exactly. I think it's very hard. It's, it's not fun. Yeah. So, ask and Philip tomorrow. You could, yes. Mm -hmm. So many people have actually also added the photons. I think it's even more interesting. Here I was looking only at the very simple case where I have no photon, but uh, I still have Coulomb, so which is kind of part of the right. instantaneous part of the photon field. So, so I was wondering to some extent a little bit, yeah, yeah it could be. It could be, but I have no answer to your. Uh, maybe this I would like to keep actually because it's uh, well. So that was part one. I was discussing this. Uh, Molecular Hamiltonian, if you like. Now I'm going to do something completely different. I'm going to look at an infinite gas. So I'm now going to go into statistical mechanics and discuss the electron gas. So part two is about uh, the electron gas, the uniform or maybe not uniform, but I will mainly discuss the uniform electron gas. Or if, okay. 
Um, so there it's easy because we know essentially nothing. And I think it's really embarrassing. So, so let me state right away. So problem uh, three, uh, prove the existence of freezing in or for uh, the, the UEG, the uniform electron gas. So I want to say that uh, at zero temperature, if the density is low, then people believe that the electron gas uh, freezes right, into a Wigner crystal or at, at low temperature. Um, I have to say that it's extremely embarrassing because we do not know how to prove freezing for any model. It's not something that's due to Coulomb. Coulomb is much harder because it's long range. So when you look at an infinite gas, then it must be very well screened, as we said. But uh, there's essentially no result, no mathematical result, okay? Even for classical, well, maybe the quantum part helps. Okay, so if I think of temperature, the same should happen in a classical system. When I lower the temperature, it should freeze. If you put water in your freezer, then it definitely does freeze. Yes? Yes. 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 No one has proved anything, okay? And this is actually problem four. Problem four will be even what you say, okay? Problem three is prove freezing. So what I mean by freezing, I mean breaking of translational symmetry. I'm not saying how it's broken. This is problem four, okay? I'm just saying it's broken, okay? So that's breaking of translations when you vary some parameters, which for the UEG, uh, I mean, because of some numerics that I will uh, I mean, remind you afterwards, we know it's when the density is small, as you said, or the temperature is small. But uh, I have to tell you that there's just no mathematical result on any two-particle interacting system, even short range, even classical, okay? So no result even for classical short range which is extremely embarrassing, and that's something that we just don't understand. We do not know how to prove that there are phase transitions. And we have no tool to prove these phase transitions that, we, I mean, that are definitely true, right? There's no doubt that they happen. And we, we just have no mathematical tool. So people have derived a kind of strategy to prove it, and so there are several steps that one should do. In many cases, the first steps have been uh, achieved, but never the last one, which is phase transitions. So it's extremely embarrassing, but I think it's very important. We should find a way of proving rigorously that there are phase transitions, right? especially uh, breaking of translations in continuous system. And of course, the next step is when there is a phase transition, what's, I mean, what kind of, uh, I mean, what is happening? So that's problem four which is a little bit more specific, uh, prove that the system is really periodic. Because it could be quasi-periodic or do some, some very crazy thing. Right? But we expect that the UEG is actually uh, uh, periodic. Right? Yes? Yes. Yes. This, uh, no, nobody, nobody has done this mathematically. I think it's very hard to do perturbative arguments, especially because it's always formulated for infinite systems. And so for infinite systems, it's very hard to control what's, uh, and so we don't know how to do. Okay, so problem four, let me be a little bit more precise. Uh, prove what's called the crystallization conjecture, crystalline conjecture, 
which is a little bit more precise. So it says it's not just that translational symmetry is broken, it's that it's really periodic, yeah, with some period and some crystal, some lattice. Okay, so it must be uh, uh, the BCC uh, lattice at low density, say zero temperature, at low density, which is what Wigner predicted in in 34. And uh, while well, say t equals zero or t small, okay. And we have no clue because we don't know how to prove that there is symmetry breaking, so it's even harder to prove uh, that it's periodic with the BCC symmetry. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, I have time. So, yes. Yes. No, no, no. I mean, uh, the, your lattice could, could be unrelated to the density. That, that's also okay. I mean, yes. But that's a very good point that it's believed that it can happen. Very good. Wonderful. Me too, actually, a little bit later. Uh, but I mean, say, even classical zero temperature, I mean, it can't be easier than that's really what Wigner said that they must form a BCC lattice. And we don't know how to prove this. And by the way, so this, uh, this uh, fourth problem has some link with number theory. Uh, because when things are on a lattice, and you immediately get into uh, zeta functions. And there are actually results that I will state. No. I mean, I mean 2D is simpler, because uh, it's, most, it's always triangular. But uh, the pr yes, there, there's a question. That's known. I think it's known that uh, the triangular lattice is a, is a local minimum. I think that's known. But global, no. If it's periodic, uh, then you can compare the square. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Yes. So it's known, and this it's due to Montgomery and these people that uh, triangular is better than square in 2D, but it's not known that it's a lattice. There is a question. But, uh, I just wanted to ask about the limits, because when you have these densities, uh, we have some kind of analog curve and stuff, so that you can uh, Is it better for, for finding the limits of the system, or do you need to find uh, So high, high dimensions are going to be different. Uh, 2D is probably easier than 3D. And so, for instance, it's been proved that for Coulomb, triangular is better than square. Actually, it's been proved that for Coulomb, triangular is the best among lattices. And so the only thing that remains is to show that they form a lattice. In 1D, everything is known, I will tell you. And when I say, well, 2D, OK. Uh, 3D is more complicated because there are more lattices. There's BCC and FCC and well. And, uh, I don't know if this answers your questions. And then the higher you go in dimension, the more complicated it gets. But there are some very special dimensions for which things are actually known, I will tell you. OK. So now I would like to describe to you what's the general main steps that people have invented in order to give a meaning to the existence of phase transitions. And what has been done for Coulomb, you will see we are stuck essentially at step one. Not quite, actually. We know more for classical systems than for quantum systems. So what are the main steps? So, so the, the, the main point, so the main idea, is that people said that to give a clear mathematical meaning to phase transitions, one should look at infinite systems. Right? Because everything is always analytic for a finite system. So you have to do a thermodynamic limit and look at the infinite system, which, of course, creates some problem. And so what are the steps that you should uh, do? So step one is to do uh, to uh, explain that the thermodynamic limit exists. Uh, 
and in particular, energy uh, uh, bounds, if you like, or if you like, the fact that the energy is extensive, it behaves like the volume or the number of particles and grow as you would expect. And even this first part for Coulomb systems was very hard to prove. And that's what's called stability of matter, essentially. So stability of matter is in the case that uh, you actually put nuclei. But uh, if you put a uniform background as you do for the UEG, then it's essentially, a, well, maybe it's a little easier. But anyway, so you want to explain how, when you have many different charges, they are, they, 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 I mean, they are placed in a way that the energy grows like the volume. And uh, if screening does not happen, it would grow much faster than the volume. And so you have to explain that screening has to happen. And this you must see in the energy. And so this problem is very famous. So it was solved first by uh, Dyson Lena in 63-64, uh, and then Lip Tiering gave a much simpler proof. Yes? 67, maybe you're right, by the way. Yes? Uh, gave a much simpler proof in uh, 75. If you are interested, you can watch these uh, YouTube videos of Dyson. Uh, I mean, there are lots of interviews about many, many subjects, and there's one just about stability of matter where he explains the difference between the two proofs um, explaining somehow what I said in the very beginning, that the lip tearing proof really teaches us something about the physics, which the proof he had with Leonard was really just lots of estimates and extremely complicated, and you could, couldn't really see where the idea was uh, somehow coming from. Anyway, and uh, they are then uh, works by uh, Lieb and Lebowitz. And by the way, so the, for the UEG, or gelium, This was studied by Lieb and Narnhofer in 73. Okay, so this is just about proving that the energy, so you take a huge uh, ball or a cube, okay, so for, the, for gelium you put a uniform background of a positive charge, and then you put your electrons. You look at the quantum problem, assume it's neutral, and then the energy behaves like the volume. And then you do the limit, you're happy, then what? Well, the, the next step is uh, step two, and we are already stuck there for Coulomb systems, but step two has been done for uh, short range systems. So it's the derivation of local bounds. So you have to prove local bounds. In a way, you have to show that screening happens locally everywhere, okay? So you have to show that everywhere there are essentially, uh, the number of particles is proportional to the local volume, and that, uh, which is also the local background, and that somehow everything is screened, and everything is nice so that you can give a meaning uh, to, to, the, to the corresponding Coulomb potential. which is felt by each particle. Okay, so imagine you have this huge, so let me make a drawing. So you have this constant background. There it is, it's constant. Okay, of course, uh, and then you've got your electrons. Let me make a, I don't know how to do a quantum drawing, so I do a classical drawing. So my, here are my electrons. Okay, and so you want to say that, uh, I mean, classically, let's look at the classical problem, zero temperature, that I just optimized their position, that they must be placed in a way that they screen very well this background. And I want to say that this electron, this one, must feel a finite electrostatic potential. But of course, the electrostatic potential fed by this guy is the sum of this huge background which creates a huge electrostatic potential, minus or plus, depending on your sign convention, the one, the one of the other blue guys. And of course you get a difference of two divergent series, and so they must compensate. But they diverge a lot, okay? And so that's the effect of screening, again. So somehow when you 
when you look at a Gibbs state or when you look at a, a minimizer ground state, then everything must be so. Because the energy is fine, it means that everything must be so that they are placed in a way that they screen the background. Okay? But this we don't know how to prove. So local bounds means that the local number of particles is bounded and the potential makes sense locally. So the interaction between any particles and the, the rest of the system. Okay. Uh, so this was done uh, for classical system on the, for the classical Coulomb gas, uniform Coulomb gas. So uh, at zero temperature, there is an argument by Lieb, which by the way was never published. I don't quite know uh, when this argument uh, so it's probably from, from the 80s, I think. But, uh, and then at positive temperature, uh, it's actually extremely hard. And there is a paper, mathematical paper by Armstrong and Sylvia Serfati. I think it's in 22, or oh, where is it? 21, where they prove uh, what I told you. They actually did not prove that the potential is uh, finite locally. They only prove that uh, the, if you like, the moments of the number of particles, okay, so the n to the power k behaves like the local volume. Okay? So done, okay, so it's just a local, local n, if you like, bounds on the local n as well as uh, the fluctuations. Uh, that has been uh, proved. We know nothing in the quantum case, and so we are essentially stuck already at step two. But there are many other uh, steps to, to do. Oh, wow. Well, well. Very good, so what is uh, step three? Step three is uh, to give a meaning to an uh, infinite equilibrium state. Because now we have local bounds, okay? So we can define what it means to be an infinite equilibrium state. If you like a Gibbs state, infinite, infinite gas. Okay, so for instance, you can say, I don't know, the correlation functions here are well defined or something like that, satisfy some equation. So there are several ways so you can Look at the B, 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 J, K, Y hierarchy, show that the correlation functions or the density matrices solve the B, B, J, K, Y hierarchy for an infinite system. Um, probabilists uh, love better the Dobruchin, Lanford, uh, Ruel condition, which is more a probabilistic way of uh, expressing things. Uh, anyway, so once you've, uh, once you've got some local bounds, then you can hope to give a meaning of what it means to be an equilibrium state. And then maybe you can start with an equilibrium state and look whether it can be translation invariant or not. Uh, for Coulomb systems, this was done only, in, well, only at t equals zero in the classical case. I mean, for the 3D Coulomb. Uh, in a long review paper I, I wrote on the subject, but for 3D Coulomb, we don't know anything at positive temperature. Okay, but I gave a meaning of what it means to be a, an equilibrium position of points in the ground state. Okay, and uh, classical, so zero temperature. That's the best that's known at the moment. And now, Step four, of course, is to look at, uh, so now we know we have a concept of equilibrium states. So somehow we forget uh, how they were constructed, that we've constructed them by a thermodynamic limit. We look at the set of all equilibrium states and we ask whether they are translation invariant or not. Okay, so now we ask whether they are, um, whether the symmetry, uh, translational symmetry is broken or not. 
I mean, that will depend on the, the temperature and the density. And since in 3D, nothing uh, was completely completed until step four, uh, then of course we are stuck. We don't know anything. But I have to tell you that even for a classical short range, where everything could go up to step three, then nothing could be done here. Okay, so even a very nice, I don't know, hardcore, very nice short range, or well, maybe hardcore is special. So say very nice, uh, fastly decaying potential, classical, uh, then nothing is known. So it's not quite true. So it's known for short range systems that symmetry will not be broken at very high temperature or very high density. Okay, so that's somehow easy because you can use some kind of fixed point. Well, easy, it's not so easy, but you can use some kind of fixed point. And so there are negative results or positive depending how you look at it. So, um, so for classical systems, there are plenty, but for Coulomb, there is actually a unique paper on the subject by Imbri in 82, which uh, relied on the previous works by Bridges and Federbusch in 80. I have to mention that last week, David Bridges got the Henri Poincaré Prize uh, for, I mean, in particular for these results at the International, Inter International Congress of Mathematical Physics. And so they could, and that's a paper in the classical case. So nobody could ever uh, deal with the quantum problem so far, but in the classical case, Imbri could prove that, uh, say, at large uh, temperature or uh, large density, so I think I should say that rho one third times T is uh, large, then uh, no breaking of symmetry And more precisely, they could prove that there is the by screening. So actually, it decays exponentially. So there is an extremely good screening. So that's the by screening. Using some kind of cluster expansions for the classical Coulomb gas, which, by the way, they represented using quantum field theory techniques. I cannot continue without mentioning the 1D Coulomb gas, for, which is completely solvable. But it's very special, so, and maybe it's not so good to call it Coulomb because it's not Coulomb, it's, I mean, it's minus uh, distance. Let, let me call it Coulomb anyway. It's not one over distance, right? So the interaction is minus uh, x minus y. And this is a completely solvable system. And for, for this system, everything is known and it's actually beautiful, but very special. So in the classical case, this was solved by Kuntz in 74 and uh, Eisenman Martin. They, they were also Lenard, yes, that's right, that's right, yes. Um, Eisenman Martin, so what they did, they, they were actually proving that they satisfied these equations. So it was a little bit more probabilistic. And uh, so what's known in the classical case, it's actually a solid at all temperature and densities. Always a solid. Which is kind of uh, fun. Uh, the quantum case uh, was proved by uh, Bras Campy in 75. Uh, but they were only looking at low density. And then it's only recently that uh, Janssen and Jung in 2014 
they prove that it's also a solid at all temperatures and all densities. Always a solid. Okay, when I say always a solid, uh, so I mean it's periodic and uh, the period, uh, no, it's not increments, right? The period is one over uh, rho. Okay. So, of course, the step five is uh, to answer problem uh, four. So, uh, the periodicity. So, namely, the prove the Wigner crystal conjecture, if you like. And uh, it happens that uh, for classical systems, more is known. It's not solved, as we discussed already a little bit earlier. Uh, in the quantum case, nothing is known. Okay. And the classical case in 3D, nothing is known either. For instance, it's not known that BCC is the best lattice. Okay, this is not proved. I mean, it's known, but not proved. Uh, very good. So, so as I told you, so they are so in the classical case, classical zero temperature, they are links with number theory. Uh, which, by the way, I explain in my review paper. So the review paper has appeared in, uh, in JMP, so the Journal of Mathematical Physics, in 22. It, it was a special edition in honor of Dyson after Dyson died. So you will find it easily. So there's a whole section about the link with the uh, Epstein zeta functions. and so on and so forth. And so it's actually very nice um, that the Wigner crystallization, well, very nice, useless, but very nice anyway, that it was actually solved very recently in dimensions eight and 24. So let me mention this. So if you look at dimension eight and 24, which is not so very useful, but anyway, uh, the, it's known that uh, particles uh, crystallize on the E8, that's in dimension 8, and on the Leach lattice. Well, so they replace the BCC lattice in 3D and the triangular in 2D. And uh, this was actually proved by Marina Vyazovska, who got the Fields Medal for this. Uh, two years ago. Okay, so it's funny that the Fields Medal was awarded to somebody in number theory who actually worked on problems related to these Coulomb systems. So the paper is by Kohn, Kumar, uh, Ratchenko, and Vyazovska in 22. And uh, she got the Fields Medal years ago for this. And I have to tell you that they do not really look at uh, Jellium. They only look at short range uh, systems, but then it was explained by uh, Petrash and Serfati in uh, 20, actually, that their proof implies uh, that the same must hold uh, for Jellium. So the situation is that in dimension two, eight and 24, there are some very special lattices which are called universal. So in dimension two, it's the triangular lattice. In dimension eight, it's the E8, and in dimension 24, it's the Leach lattice, which have some uh, algebraic, uh, very specific properties. And so they, when you minimize something, it's always this lattice that must uh, arise due to some algebraic properties. For some reason, they could not do the proof in 2D. That would be very interesting. It's probably the next step. And then we would have a proof of uh, Wigner's uh, uh, conjecture in 2D. That would be physically very interesting. But uh, their proof does not work in 2D. I don't know why. Although the triangular lattice is universal in uh, their sense. 
In 3D, there's no universal lattice because a universal lattice is always the dual to itself and BCC, the dual is FCC. So uh, nothing like this can work in 3D. I, I guess it's hopeless to expect uh, that a uh, number of theoretists will be able to say something about our Coulomb gas. And so now some last comments uh, about the shape of uh, the phase diagram. So as I told you, I mean, uh, rigorously, one can maybe hope to prove that there is a phase transition, but it's gonna be very hard to say exactly what's happening. And I have to warn you that uh, it can't be just BCC all, all the time, right? I mean, it, it's expected to be extremely rich, uh, this phase diagram. So there's a lot of numerics, but it's also, I mean, extremely complicated to do a reliable numerics on this problem. Okay, so lots of numerics. This you know better than me. I mean, it started, of course, with a separate lay and, and it's still going on with uh, many people right now. And also we should discuss spin, right? Spin is going to play a role as well. I was not discussing spin so much, so the spin symmetry can also be broken. Somehow it's a, it's a finite symmetry, so it's a little bit different. It's not like a translation environment, but we also have no tool to prove that uh, spin symmetry is broken. And um, here, th there were very uh, interesting uh, discussions in the physics community. So I learned from uh, Marcus uh, Holtzman, uh, well, I was gonna say recently, but I think it's like three years ago already, uh, that uh, the situation is not so clear. So in particular, at zero temperature, it's not so clear whether uh, there will be a ferromagnetic uh, transition. So somehow whether it occurs before or after uh, the, the Wigner crystal problem. So maybe I do a kind of drawing, it's going to be very, I mean, I'm not gonna do the real phase diagram, but just a quick uh, drawing. So what's the situation? So it's believed that there is a, a BCC phase like this, more or less. Okay, I'm not so sure about the shape of the, but there is some kind of BCC uh, region like this. There is an FCC, right? But uh, I don't know where it stops, somewhere here. So at zero, temp at zero temperature, the FCC was not predicted, well, it's not so clear, but it, it could be that it does not uh, uh, occur, right? or maybe it was, right? And then to this, you have to add a, a so, so of course here, so at low density, your system is very close to being classical. So here it's really a classical fluid if, in a sense. Here is really a quantum fluid. And to this picture, which is pure uh, translational uh, symmetry, you have to add the spin, okay? And so it was not so clear. So there must also be a region where it, be, where uh, your paramagnetic fluid becomes ferromagnetic. And it was not so clear, maybe I make it like this, whether this stops here or whether this stops there somehow. So here, uh, ferromagnetic. So I think that uh, numerics predicted that there must be first a ferromagnetic uh, fluid and that before the Wigner crystal. And then there was this paper by uh, Holtzman and Moroni in 20, where uh, they were not so sure anymore. Very good. And then uh, I worked myself uh, on uh, something uh, very interesting, which is the Hartree-Fock phase diagram. And of course for Hartree-Fock, one can do much more precise numerics because the complexity is much lower. And so you may know that there were these old papers by Overhauser in the 60s, uh, where he predicted that actually uh, translational symmetry must always be broken at zero temperature. And then there are very nice works uh, by uh, people from a few uh, meters away from Jussieu, so there, there's Baguet, De Lyon, 
Camus and Holzmann. It started in 13, but there are several uh, papers where they computed very precisely the phase diagram of Hartree-Fock gelium. And they found many, many uh, transitions at t equal to zero. Okay, it was not just BCC and then a fluid. Actually, there were many transitions and there were lots of incommensurate crystals. And it, it's always a solid one because of over there. So at large densities, then they saw some incommensurate crystals. When the density is gross. And uh, I think they also did some uh, correlated methods that suggest that this could even stay. And it's a very interesting question to investigate if such uh, phases actually exist for the true phase diagram. I don't know what's the exact situation. So somehow for Hartree Fox, the, the picture is a, a little bit like this, okay? So you have the same kind of bump, but then this thing goes to zero like this. It does not stop at the axis. Here it's the Wigner crystal. It's not BCC all the way. There are lots of phase transitions inside this uh, solid uh, phase. And actually what we proved uh, is that this curve here is exponentially small. Okay, so it's exponentially small. This we proved with uh, Gontier and Heinzel. And that was in 19. Okay, so somehow for Hartree Fock, then it's always a solid with many different phases, but this curve here, here again it's T and here it's rho to the one third. And this curve is extremely small. Right? So it's like exponential minus rho to the one over six, by the way. Okay, so very, very small. But, but it does not touch the axis, very small, but does not touch. So it's extremely rich. And I think there are a lot, uh, I mean, there are many things that one can say. So Hartree Fock is a little easier to study mathematically, of course, because uh, you know what uh, the fluid is in a way. You just take the free Fermi gas, that's the fluid. So you know what to perturb about in a way, which you don't for, uh, which you don't for an infinite correlated system. And so there are many open questions and I have to stop. I will stop now just to leave you some room for questions. Thank you. Questions before the uh, post cafe. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, yes. He actually showed this couple cusp. Yes, yes, actually, it was on, on my paper, and then I said, Oh, I, I'm afraid I will be late, so I. Yes. We have generalized these time relations mm -hmm. uh, to Coulomb systems, and then using sort of short distance factorization of wave functions. And then yes. You, yeah, you can show this assuming that there's a short distance factorization, but then mm -hmm. actually what we, we have done is we, lo we looked up, and Kato had sort of essentially done this uh, mathematically precise. Yes, yes, yes. Very important, I agree. So Kato studied the regularity of the eigenfunctions and he got these Kato cusp conditions, both at the nucleus as well as at the electron uh, uh, coalescence or something. And it's believed, uh, and there are studies, mathematical, rigorous studies, that uh, this cusp, uh, the, the electronic cusp condition is the reason uh, why uh, you get quite low uh, numerical convergence uh, when you do Hartree Fock or so somehow. I mean, these cups, okay, let me rephrase it. If you solve the Hartree Fock equations, uh, then there will be no cusp conditions because you have finitely many orbitals. They are extremely nice functions. And so it's this cusp that make it so that you need to have uh, many uh, Slater determinants in order to better represent uh, your functions. And there are papers by uh, Hill, I believe, uh, for two electrons where he explains that uh, the 
the speed of convergence in terms of the number of uh, determinants you put uh, is really completely due to these cusp conditions. And this was also studied very recently by mathematicians, a uh, guy called uh, Alex Sobolev. So it's extremely important. I, I agree. question concerning sort of this locality story. I mean, there's a well-known notion by sort of which brought up, was brought up by Walter Kohn on saying yes. th uh, this nearsightedness of the many-body wave function. Mm -hmm. uh, basically saying, okay, uh, if I make a perturbation here, the system sort of far away will not feel it. I mean, is anything known exactly about that? No, no, nothing so is. It's a hand-waving argument, and I, th I also think it's very interesting. And I think the whole argument is that people believe that there exists this cone sham potential, and uh, which allows to remove completely the interaction and replace it by, a, by an external potential. So the whole uh, th thing about uh, cone sham and Hohenberg cone in the 60s was to remove the Coulomb interaction completely and replace it by a non-interacting problem, but with uh, a non-linear external potential, and we don't know if it's true or not. In a way, we don't know if the, this potential exists. We, if it exists, we don't know its properties, and so there's no way that you, we can actually formalize this kind of argument. But we will be trying. Eh bien, merci. So thank you, everybody. Maybe we can go to the. Thank you. Break now.